Okay, this is the second uh, uh, video. I guess I can raise my foot electric tie here. Second video for chapter seven and eight, and I'm picking picking up where I left off before, which were the, the three observations uh, that couldn't really be explained by classical mechanics back in you know starting like around the, the turn of the century, around around 1890 or so. The, the third one had to do with atomic spectrum. So here's the experiment: you take uh, uh, you take a, a, a set of hydrogen atoms and you energize them greatly, put them in a, in a very high energy situation uh, and to the point where they start emitting light because they're, you know, they're bright and they're, and they're energetic. And you extract that light and you examine it. And it turns out when you examine the light emitted from high energy hydrogen, uh, you don't see a spectrum. You don't see you know, light of all colors. In fact, you, you only see certain energy, uh, you only see certain frequencies of light. And the pic, the, I won't try to draw this, as you can tell my drawing's pretty lousy, but in the book it checks the shows, it, it looks something along the lines, if you look at the whole spectrum where, you know, where this is, you know, red and this is blue, you know, dark red and deep blue, uh, and, and, and deep blue um, the hydrogen uh, spectrum has, you know, a, a few lines here and there, and, uh, and but but not but not not all of them. In fact, it's it's totally black except for a few frequencies. And sure enough, you do the same sort of experiment with other uh, with other elements. Uh, you'll see a different spectrum, and it almost becomes like like a fingerprint for the element itself. And this couldn't really be explained using using classical mechanics. Now, it was easy to actually predict this. In fact, someone came up with an equation to kind of predict the atomic. Or it's not really not even predict to fit the data observed by the atomic spectra into some sort of formula that made it kind of look like there were a discrete number of these things, but no one could, could kind of explain why. And it, it, it worked against the, the notion that, again, that, that electrons were, uh, were somehow being, uh, were, you know, were releasing energy because they were decaying in their orbits, or, you know, again, the classical representation just didn't make any sense. But even in whatever classical representation they had for electrons emitting energy because their orbits were decaying or something, seemed to uh, indicate that if that were the case, there'd be a, a, a uniform spectrum of energies because an electron could be taking you know a wild spin into the nucleus or a shorter spin in the nucleus and basically any values in between. And so you should see uh, basically all frequencies represented. But in, in reality, we only saw a, a, a few discrete ones. This led to a, a, a different, uh, and so anyway, so this, uh, what, what the, uh, the spectrum kind of shows is that there are discrete energy levels um, in, uh, in, in an atom, and that uh, it, you can cer certainly measure for each of these lines. What, what we're actually seeing is an electron changing its energy state from one level to another. And so it's, it's another case where the uh, the energy levels were seen as as discrete, uh, and that and for a, at this point in time, that the classical understanding of matter in this case electrons didn't seem to hold. There wasn't there didn't seem to be any model that uh, that explained why an electron would have only discrete states in our understanding of what a, what an electron was doing uh, around around the atom. Okay. So Bohr came up with a model, and, and actually, you know, using the, the hydrogen spectra, Bohr actually came up with a model that has said, all right, here's what's going on. We have a nucleus, and we have an electron that's orbiting um, around or, you know, in the vicinity of the nucleus. And what Bohr said is that there's only, uh, an electron can only change out of that orbit by going from one orbit to another. But it can't go to an arbitrary spot. It has to actually land on another one of these orbits. And it, it quickly became clear that the word orbit wasn't such a good word, but it was kind of batted around because that was what people thought about in the classical model of an electron. And so the idea was that a hydrogen atom here could be excited up to here and then could, be, uh, could release energy by dropping down to here or dropping down to here. And you can continue this model for, you know, eight or so levels. And what you can show is that an electron can go from the outer level, you know, back to this level, uh, 
all the way to that level. You know, it can bounce around any way it wants uh, based upon the ability to either absorb a photon of energy to, to go out to an outer level that, that was a more energetic uh, orbit or to release a photon of energy when it drops from a high energy state down to a low energy state. And in fact, it is that drop down from a high to a low that we're actually observing when we look at the, 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 the spectrum of hydrogen. Every time a high energy electron drops down, if it drops down a long ways, it's giving up a lot of energy. So it shows up higher in, in, in the higher frequency range. If it's dropping down, let's say only from one level to another, it'll show up in the lower frequency end. And in fact, when it drops like really you know, small, like from one high level to the next high level, it's such a small amount of energy that we don't even see it in the visible spectrum. It's way out in the infrared spectrum. Sure enough, this model seemed to fit the hydrogen spectra data perfectly um, and, uh, and gave a lot of promise to the fact that these orbits, the electron behavior, you know, how, how the electron actually spent its time near the nucleus, was in a funny sort of way. It wasn't classical. It wasn't like like uh, planets around a, a, a star or anything like that. It seemed to be odd. In fact, it, it, it gave some, uh, s some, some ideas to other scientists. Now, one thing I want to say about, about Bohr's uh, model for the atom is that um, w when he developed this, this idea further and, and he was able to generate the math for it, he showed that, sure enough, he could predict all of these energy, st energy uh, deltas, basically the energy... Uh, that showed up in, 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 the, in the spectral lines by, by this model of a single uh, proton, basically the, in the hydrogen atom, and a single electron bouncing between all these states. However, sadly, it didn't show, it didn't uh, uh, fit the observations of any other elements. It only worked for hydrogen. It didn't work for anything else, which is a bit discouraging. But it gave some other scientists an idea, and it, it later gave uh, a really interesting idea to a scientist by the name of de Broglie, who basically said, hmm, all right, so all of this stuff going on uh, for black body radiation and the photoelectric effect and even this spectra seems to indicate a quantization of energy. Basically, energy, light, is no longer, uh, can, can solely be considered as, as a wave. It actually has some, some particle-like, matter-like uh, behavior. What if the inverse were also true? And he basically said, what if matter, especially down at the smaller levels, doesn't always behave just like a particle? What if the matter actually behaves like a wave in, 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 some, in some characteristics as well? And sure enough, he actually uh, 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 theorized this. And uh, what, what, for, what then developed was that, sure enough, electrons also have a, or, or matter, also have a wavelength uh, associated with it. And the wavelength is essentially only meaningful for small objects. And there's a, there's a formula that the, the book talks about. You can actually even calculate a wavelength for large objects, but the wavelength is, you know, is kind of ridic ridiculously absurd. It only really is meaningful when you have uh, 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 mass particles that are small. And in case of an electron, it, it, it works out perfectly. So it turns out that the explanation for, for this behavior of an electron and other kind of really quirky behavior so that I'll mention, maybe I'll mention on this video a little bit later, um, are, are well explained by the fact that, that matter, and in this case we're talking about electrons, actually have certain wave-like characteristics to it. Okay, so de Broglie uh, uh, um, proposed that, and then a, a bit later there was a, a really famous uh, equation that was presented by uh, by, why am I blanking on his name? Um, it's terrible that I'm blanking on his name. Very, 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 very important. Uh, uh, Schrodinger, thank you. Uh, Schrodinger uh, actually came up with, a, with a, an equation um, to explain the relationship between the energy levels of an atom and, er, and the position of the particles involved. And he, he actually... Uh, solve this for the, the simplest case, which is a hydrogen atom and a single electron. And he, he, uh, he developed an equation which became known as the, well, it, it's, the shorthand is called the wave equation, but again, the wave equation is, is general. It can apply to all sorts of things in, in, in physics. 
but in, in, in specifically he came up with a wave equation that applied or related the energy states in an atom, simple atom like hydrogen, to the positional characteristics, I'll describe it, of the particles involved. And essentially, in the case of hydrogen, it, there's, there's a, a single proton and the electron is somewhere else. So the, the dimensional characteristics or the space characteristics are essentially about the relative position of the electron to the, to the uh, nucleus, which in this case is a single proton. And he ended up solving this, and uh, probably at the end of this uh, tape. So I so I ended up solving this, and it yet again it it resulted in a mathematical solution that re, that ended up using quantum numbers, essentially integer numbers. If you remember back in the Planck uh, equation, I had the number n, and where n could be one, two, three, four, five, etc., for all the different dis, 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 discrete energy states. Uh, Similarly, in this case, and, and by the way, in Bohr's atom model, he ended up, he ended up calling these, these rings using a quantum number as well. This was quantum number n equals 1, and this was quantum number n equals 2, and the other one was 3, etc. And so he ended up uh, using the same terminology calling these quantum numbers uh, that reflected the actual states of a hydrogen atom. But and I'll, I'll pick back up in, in the next video, but when you solve the Schrodinger equation, what you find out is that this, this quantity of n is still around. It's still one of the quantum numbers. But when you solve that equation, it turns out there's other quantum numbers that pop up also. And those other numbers that pop up are, are really significant with respect to chemistry. And I'll pick back up in, in, the, in, this, in the next video.